Um, so we're looking at this is webinar four now. Um, with many thanks to the IHHC for the ability to coordinate this webinar series. Um, they've been really well received. So um, again, many thanks to the IHHC for the opportunity to present these. So this particular webinar, we're looking at the ITSI fork pressure test and the particle size tests. What are they and why are they used? And we're doing a special spotlight on ITSI level five, which is the minced and moist um, level there. Um, I'd also like to um, do a, a very quick thank you also to our both our international sponsors and also our Australian Steering Committee. So our webinar goals here are to, um, to look at the EDSI fork pressure test and the particle size testing. Um, also to talk about why they're important for patient safety to reduce choking risk, that spotlight on level five and some recipe sharing ideas that I hope might be helpful for you. Very briefly, just looking at comparing the Australian National Descriptors with IDSI. Um, on the, the right hand side of the slide there, you'll see the fairly iconic image um, that's there. That, just to let you know, we are, um, IDSI is in the process of developing um, a poster that will be made available and the Australian Steering Committee will look at the poster and make any adjustments so that it's suitable for an Australian audience. So, what we're focusing on today, as far as the Australian standards are concerned, is our um, really our texture being minced and moist. Uh, and you can see that, that most of our um, information about that is fairly subject subjective. It's not overly specific, although there is some information in there about particle sizes, and I'm not sure how well that was recognised um, when the Australian standards were published. Um, because they, uh, the, the descriptive information was included on the poster, but probably not the particle size information. With IDSI, um, we are talking about this minced and moist level five area here. Um, and we do have specific particle size measurements for adults and, and children, and also some testing methods that I'll go through later on. So just a, a reminder then about why we're doing all of this. And this is a, a real case study that's come from the New South Wales Ombudsman's report from 2015 that looked into the deaths of people with disability in residential aged care. I'm not going to read the entirety of this passage, um, but just to, to say that this was a, a gentleman who um, had died after choking on a large piece of carrot. And that when all of the information was reviewed, um, the conclusion they came to was that the available guidance for staff on, the, on that man's mealtime requirements was inconsistent and that the support plan didn't reflect the recommendations of the speech pathologist and the GP on his need for softer cut up meals and the use of sauces and gravies to soften his food. So they found that inconsistent information may have led staff to inadvertently give the man food that was unsafe for his swallowing requirements. So that's a reminder about why that consistent terminology is just so important there. The second piece to all of that though is looking at what actually happens when we chew and swallow. And, and these are um, fabulous video images that have been very kindly shared um, to Idzi by um, the creators of the Dynamic Swallow. So this first one I'm going to show you, it's a, a moving x-ray. We're looking side on at the person chewing. Um, there will be a black substance that you can see in that person's mouth and it's color, It's um, in fact, when you have a, a video fluoroscopy, it's a white um, substance, but it shows up black on the x-ray. So let's, let's have a look at that. There's no sound associated with this. You can see the person opening and shutting their jaw, chewing, and very quickly that the whole thing holds together really nicely as the person swallows. I'm going to show that one more time. So it holds together, the person's using their tongue to collect it and then push it back and swallow it down. It goes down the part that's closest to the person's spine for swallow safety. If it were to go to the front, that would be going down their airway. Now let's look at the second one for differences. So this time you can see the person still chewing, but most of that chewing is happening at the front of the mouth. You can also see that little bits are starting to come apart and fall over the back of that person's tongue and into their throat. So it's not coordinated in nearly the same way as the first one was. So just again, watching that again, little bits are being chewed up and it's not holding together. The person's continuing to chew. There are bits falling over the back of their tongue and into their throat. 
and then the swallow occurs. So whilst nothing went down the wrong way, we obviously can see how easy it would be for material to go down the wrong way though. Okay, so moving back to our Australian um, guidelines, and um, so these were published in 2007, so they're, they're now we're looking at 11 years old now. So our texture being minced and moist, we have a descriptive information um, about it being soft and moist, easily forming into a ball. We've got some other characteristics here as well, um, so that you could, should be able to use your tongue rather than your teeth to break it into small lumps as well. And there is in fact, um, there was included in the Australian guidelines some testing information around particle size for um, infants and children uh, and also for um, children over the age of five years and also for adults as well. So if we skip down to have a look now at what we've got with IDSI and um, what we're looking here at, at evidence-based food particle size and textures and I wanted to provide you with a, a again a little bit of a background to how we came to this. Um, so the level six which we focus on in the next webinar is soft and bite size. So this is if you can imagine if you were taking a bite of food roughly what size that bite of food might be like um, and for pe people with swallowing problems you want it to be soft, soft enough as well. Then we move over to where the person has difficulty even biting off a piece of food or perhaps doesn't have the, the strength or also the coordination to hold it together as we saw in that video that we watched just then. So the minced and moist um, bolus is supposed to be representative of a predominantly chewed bolus. So for clinicians who might be listening, uh, like myself, the kind of things that you would do here is that when you watch someone um, taking a piece of food and chewing it, you might ask them to open their mouth before they swallow it down to look and see that it has been chewed well enough that you haven't got large pieces that might be a choking risk there. So what we know is that the um, the particle sizes, for, certainly for healthy people, um, of a chewed bolus are somewhere between two and four millimetres in size. And then um, for people who have difficulty even chewing the bolus where they need it to be so incredibly smooth and soft um, and moist, that they just simply need to push it back. That was the puree. And that's the texture level that we spoke about at the last webinar. So our minced and moist, um, the ITSI level five then, um, I mentioned the two to four millimetres in particle size. And I'll talk a little bit more about those um, in a moment. But in terms of our measurement then, we use the fork test for that. Uh, we discovered that uh, around the world pretty much um, a four pronged dinner fork uh, the gap between those prongs measures four millimeters uh, and I have pediatric clinicians who reliably tell me that the tip of the fork of a metal fork is about two millimeters as well so the easiest way to look for compliance in the uh, particle size measurement is simply by using the, the fork there to check the particle sizes. The beautiful thing about it is that if you find some pieces that are too large, you can use the fork to mash them down so that they are the correct size. ITSI includes on its website um, a number of videos to assist you. So this is available on the ITSI website and also on the app as well. So these are demonstrations of the minced and moist. So first of all, the pressure test. You should be able to press down gently with the, um, the fork or a spoon. You shouldn't actually um, make your thumbnail blanch to white. With this texture, you don't want it so runny that it's dripping through the fork. You should be able to eat this texture with a fork. We don't want it to be sticky. So we use the spoon tilt test to make sure that it holds together, but also that it slips off without leaving residue. Because we are an international uh, framework, we have places in the world that don't use forks, and so we have chopstick tests. So for example, in um, China and Japan, we also, again, because we are an international um, group, there are places that don't use cutlery at all. So places um, in rural and remote regions or Africa, South Africa, for example. And in the ITSI framework, you'll see some specific testing methods re um, relevant to each of those different testing methods. But wherever you are in the world, please use the, the testing methods that best suit your purposes. 
So when we come to look at what those minced and moist um, particle sizes look like, I've got two images here. Um, so you can see the four millimetre lump size. Um, we've got the, the protein, we've got some carrot, we've got some broccoli, and then the paediatric version, which you can see is a finer version of that. Now, I, I did want to make mention that these are purely to show you for textual purposes. Um, they are not to, uh, um, to aspire to for presentation purposes necessarily. One of the questions that we quite often get with ITSI is when do we change from the paediatric to the adult particle sizes and how did, you know, where did the particle size measurements come, um, come about from? So as I mentioned, the, um, the minced and moist um, particle sizes are designed to mimic a, a predominantly chewed bolus. Um, we want to make sure as well that if you were to accidentally swallow them down without chewing them particularly much um, or even swallow them down without chewing, that they're not going to cause the airway to block up, which is why it's important that they're not particularly sticky, for example, as well, because they could stick to the opening of the airway. So in terms of the, the reason for the differences in the particle size requirements are because of the tra uh, tracheal diameters. Um, and you can see that there's a range there for both paediatrics and also adults as well. So what we've tried to do is to operate from a safety perspective, but we recognise that there are individual differences there. The way um, you would change across or you would know to change across from a paediatric to the adult particle sizes um, are one of two methods. So First of all, when the person or the child is physically big enough, um, and this I can um, give you an analogy, is a little bit like um, using weight for when you might change the baby's car seat orientation around from um, rear facing to forward facing. So it's not so much an age thing, it's more to do with how big the person is um, for the IDSI guidelines. And so an example there, if you, if you really need to um, come down to it would be, uh, for example, at puberty, there's been um, sufficient growth so that for girls around 10 to 14 years of age, boys 12 to 16 years of age, they're nearing their, um, their adult um, dimensions, for, for want of a better term. Um, in addition to that, though, we're also very happy for um, a doctor who is happy that there has been sufficient tracheal growth um, that that they are happy that the um, four millimetre particle size is used um, for children as well to minimise choking risk there. So either of those two methods are, um, are possible when it comes to um, clinical implementation. One of the other questions that we've had um, has recently come up um, as to why there's a, it's a perceived difference between the IDSI framework where it says um, we ask for a four millimetre um, lump size and I'm specifically using the adult particle sizes here but it's just as applicable um, to the paediatric ones. Uh, but the IDSI audit sheet for minced and moist says equal to or less than four mils and no longer than 15 mils. So the answer to that um, is a, a little bit longer. The framework document does say a four millimetre lump size and clarification was requested of us as people came to put those definitions into practice. So they were saying, do those lumps need to be exactly four millimetres by four millimetres? And that if the answer was yes to that, it would mean that things like rice, which probably have been included on a minced and moist diet in the past would no longer be suitable unless they were ground down or modified. And when you really grind the food down to exactly four millimetre particle size, um, you lose a lot of the textural variety that's there. And you also lose a lot of the visual appeal as well. So if uh, rice, as I say, for example, is roughly eight to 10 millimetres long, but less than four millimetres wide. Um, there are other examples like um, orzo pasta or risoni pasta as well. So if it doesn't need to be exactly four millimetres by four millimetres, then how are we best to describe it? Um, and the answer there is four millimetres by four millimetres by no more than 15 millimetres. Um, so that it's it's like a chewed bolus. Um, we don't have any images, I'm sure you'll appreciate, of a chewed bolus to share with you because it might put you off your lunch. Um, these are some other examples of, of meals that have been prepared. So this is a, a Mexican chili and rice where the, the meat particle sizes are nice and moist, they're soft and they've been mixed in together with the rice particles. And then a spiced lamb and pearl couscous. Again, you can see that the pearl couscous 
um, is of a dimension um, where it will fit between the, the prongs of a fork. So in one dimension, but it's certainly no longer than 15 millimetres. We're not suggesting that you take the particle sizes to 15 millimetres. Um, and certainly if it is four millimetres by four millimetres by four millimetres, that's fine as well. We're just trying to let you know that you can have some textual variety here. So this is another, um, this is a uh, pasta primavera where all of the little uh, vegetable pieces have been chopped down to the um, four millimetre particle size but the Rizzoni pasta that's there um, is slightly longer, so it's about eight millimetres in length. And it's been bound together by a, um, a sauce, and you can see using the, um, this is using a plastic fork, that it holds together, comes off quite easily there. So there are, to reiterate, three considerations that we need for this minced and moist um, diet, and they are particle size, food properties, specifically the softness and the moisture content. So the particle size, our research shows that the average size of particles in a chewed bowl is for hard foods is between two and four millimetres. So they're not a uniform size. And we do tend to swallow softer foods with slightly larger particle sizes. A lot of the research that we have in this area comes from adults. There is very, very little um, in terms of paediatric um, information, although there are some um, a couple of um, articles on that. So our clinical assessment should always be used to determine if the person can safely manage the particle sizes as outlined in that level five minced and moist. In terms of food properties, the softness, the framework document shows that the food should be soft enough to squash easily with minimal pressure from the fork or the spoon. So you shouldn't need the thumbnail to blanch to white. And the idea is that if you had that food um, in your mouth that you could use your tongue to squash it and break it apart. You wouldn't necessarily need your teeth to chew it. In terms of moisture content, we know that for a healthy person, a well-chewed bolus has saliva that helps to bind the bolus together and also make it nice and slippery to make it easy to swallow. So again, we're trying to mimic those properties in the level five minced and moist food. So they need to either have sufficient moisture or we need to add sufficient moisture so that it will bind it together without it being too sticky and without it being too runny. The way we test that is using the spoon tilt test to assess for stickiness and the fork drip test to check that the food's not too runny as I showed you before. So the clinical utility and purpose of this is that it promotes chewing by some of that little bits of irregularity of the particle size, but not so much that fatigue or choking is a risk factor. Those particle sizes should be small enough that if they're accidentally swallowed without much chewing, they shouldn't block the airway. Uh, this is a reminder again about what the Idzi spoon tilt test looks like. So you take a, um, a metal teaspoon or a plastic teaspoon. Um, we're, we're tending to use a metal one for the fork, so that, that's often quite helpful to have a metal teaspoon as well. Um, you take a, a spoonful, tip the spoonful on its side and then give it a flick with your wrist and you should find that the, um, the bolus comes off and lands in the, the bowl relatively together. It might spread a little bit. You should be able to see the spoon through any residue that's there. So in that top image of the Greek yogurt, that's suitable. In the bottom image of a nut butter, you can see that it's way too sticky. You could actually hold that spoon upside down and the thing would not fall off. So for safety, we want that bolus to be cohesive enough to hold its shape and hold itself together, but not sticky. We don't want it to be a sticky bolus. So at the risk of being repetitive, all three elements are critical. The particle size and the softness and the moisture. It needs to pass all three for it to be suitable. So um, this is the audit sheet that I mentioned before. Um, the audit sheets are available um, on the IDSI website under the resources tab. If you click on to implementation and then click on to audit sheets, uh, that will open up another tab and you'll see that there are a range of PDFs that you can download here. So there's information in there that you can fill in, um, again, telling you what the critical features are. Um, there are some stars next to those and the optional ones. So the chopstick test, for example, is included down there and, and 
um, so some other um, suggestions for how to um, evaluate the food items. The other thing that we have developed that we hope will be helpful um, are these resource cards. So these are business card size templates um, that you can download, take to a, um, a printing firm so they are, are print ready. Um, and you can get these printed out for your organisation. Um, they are IDSI copyrighted, so we do ask people not to apply their own other material to them, but um, certainly as a resource for, for nurses, for clinical staff, for food, um, food service staff, catering staff to have in their pocket. Um, our graphic artist has made sure that at the bottom there, that those four millimetre lines, you can use those as a, a quick check and the two millimetre lines, it's a reminder that for level five, what the particle size requirements are in the, the spoon tilt test. Uh, next webinar, we'll talk about the soft and bite size, and this is where you find those resources. Um, again, on the resources tab, under implementation, under food test cards, you'll notice that there are different ones, so the, um, there is no standardisation of business cards, interestingly enough, which is why you'll see all the different um, countries listed up there. So I mentioned earlier on as well about the images. Now images are really helpful to for education but we need to be um, clear about what we're educating about. So these images are really helpful to um, talk about the size of the particle pieces and looking at the moisture content. This is the adult one on the, um, the left with the fork in it and the paediatric one on the right. When we come to presentation though, it's often, um, we, we can still do some quite nice things with that. So this is a layered one that's um, a paediatric example where we've got the, this time the broccoli's on the bottom, we've got the carrot on the top of that. And this was just made using some um, biscuit cutters, in fact, and then the, the meat was using a little star cutter there and we've got a close up image there. So that, to me anyway, looks far more appealing to eat than the previous image. And similarly, just a reminder that even something as simple as using a, a mould um, for, for adults to put the, the food in uh, makes it more visually appealing. So you can visit the, um, the IDSI YouTube channel where we've got some um, resources that have already been recorded and I'll show you some from the, in the next set of slides. But I also wanted to let you know that we've got a webinar coming up um, in October, it's at a couple of diff different time frames, and these are two chefs who are going to um, share their experiences of texture modified foods um, with us. So if you have an opportunity to link in um, live, you can, otherwise um, that it will be recorded and, and go up onto the ITSI YouTube channel. So in terms of what's already up on the IDSI YouTube channel, and so this is a paediatric example um, of that real cross-sector um, collaboration. So these are two speech pathologists, Jen Ramanick and um, Danielle Monica, um, and they work at the Children's Hospital of Orange County in um, California in the USA. So they're at a, an acute care regional paediatric hospital, 279 beds in their main hospital. They implemented last year um, over a nine month period and were kind enough um, to develop and then share with ITSI um, recipe books. So they've got a recipe book for minced and moist and also one for puree and they will shortly be up on the um, resources tab. But I just, I thought I'd just share these with you. So very kindly they've shared this information. Quinoa. Um, for example, for the paediatrics, fits that two millimetre particle size, who knew? Um, and you can mix it with pesto um, to, or, or even you know, other different types of sauces as well to find something that's a bit novel and unique. Scrambled eggs with salsa is another recipe option that they included there um, and their turkey and gravy. So they, they give you some um, examples and even if they just get your own creative juices going um, of what can be, you know, what else could be developed. So there's a range of different things in their uh, recipe book, their ground beef with marinara sauce, etc. So those will be made available on the EDSI website. But if you'd like a copy prior to that, please do email me. Bread. Um, okay, so this is one of the other ones that can be um, quite challenging and ITSI has developed a, um, a method by which you can create a minced and moist sandwich. Um, I'm not sure whether our audio is going to, to come out um, on the webinar, so I may also um, talk through it a little bit, see how we go.
So I'm actually going to turn the audio off. Um, there is a, a commentary that goes with this video um, that you'll be able to listen to as well. It's talking about the choking risks associated with bread. We often think of it as soft, but you need about 30 chewing actions, in fact, um, to chew bread down. This is a video that we watched uh, last time round that shows that when you don't chew it well and people just try and tip their head back and swallow it down, that it will end up going down the front way towards the airway. We recognise though that um, obviously a lot of people, particularly in the Western world, rely on bread, enjoy the, um, the variety that bread and sandwiches offer as well. So we have come up with a, a way of preparing um, a minced and moist level sandwich where you take the bread, you remove the crust from the bread and you pop it in a food processor and finally chop it up so that it's the right particle size. Then once you've done that, um, you put it in a food mould. Don't Please don't use the um, store-bought um, breadcrumbs though, they're too hard. So we take the equivalent of a cup of the um, breadcrumbs and pop them into a food mould. This is just an example of a single one. And then you spray um, using just an atomizer bottle um, that you might pick up from a hairdressing salon or even a gardening store um, to moisten those breadcrumbs. And then make sure that whatever filling you're using is suitable as well. So if it's minced and moist, that's a, um, some egg that's been mashed up with mayonnaise, making sure it's not too sticky. That gets laid over the top. And then we add further breadcrumbs again over the top of that. And once we've done that, we spray it again. So that um, you could spray it with water, you could spray it with milk, you could spray it with um, chicken stock or beef stock or, or pretty much anything. And so it will actually look like a... Um, like a sandwich and if you pop it in the the fridge for a while um, both the moisture will go through um, but it will also help to to give it a little bit of um, shape there and you can cut it you won't be able to pick it up in your fingers though you will need to use a, um, a fork or a spoon to eat it so as I say that video is available um, on the ITZY YouTube channel as well so just a reminder as well then that um, there are many of these resources that are available on the IDSI app and it's available for free both on the um, on iOS and Android platforms at Google Play as well as the, um, the app store as well. Once you've downloaded the app, you don't need to continue to use data um, or be connected to Wi-Fi because the, the videos are actually embedded within the, um, the app there. So... Um, and we are constantly updating that thing as well. I'm happy to, um, I will unmute people momentarily and stop sharing the screen. Um, but also uh, if we are, um, I, I have a, a newsletter that gets put out uh, at least once a month. Um, if you're not currently on the mailing list and you'd like to be, please email me at australia at idsi.org. Um, either to join the mailing list or if you happen to think of questions after the webinar or if you'd like a copy of the, um, the Children's Hospital of Orange County um, cookbook, um, that's the best way to reach me there. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen now and um, unmute people. <laughs> Actually, what I might do is so go back. I am going to mute you <laughs> again and allow you to unmute yourselves if you've got a question. Alternatively, there is a chat box and you're most welcome to, um, to type something in the chat box. Troy, I'm not sure whether I have just inadvertently muted you though. No, I'm fine. I just un unmuted myself. So um, I know there was an email that come through and. Um, Julie will have that, she'll answer that question. And then if anybody else has thought of any questions during the presentation, or if you have any questions, um, we'll open up and we'll get Julie to um, answer those as well. So what was the question that come through the other day via email? I can't even remember. Um, that was the one that was in the webinar there about why there was the, the difference between the four millimetre lump size okay. in the framework, um, as opposed to what the audit sheet says.
Okay. Um, so, so yeah, when we were talking about a lump size, we were, I guess we were trying to be deliberately not uh, overly prescriptive. Um, but what we were hearing from people was that they did actually want us to be a bit more prescriptive about it, which is why we've gone back to the literature and we've looked to see, um, you know, what further guidance we can give you that's evidence-based there. So does anybody have any questions for Julie? If you're looking to how to unmute yourself, I realised there was a lot of noise when I unmuted everyone before. Um, certainly if you've got a computer, um, rolling your mouse over the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little microphone. Um, and if you click on that, it'll, it will give you the option to unmute. Troy, you've got the details on how to unmute. Yeah, just on an iPad, if you um, touch the screen and then um, the, the menu bar will come up the top there's a mute button up there you can just um, press the microphone button and it'll unmute the chats up there as well if you go into the little box that says participants and down the bottom there's the chat area um, so I've had a question here about what the cost uh, for the cookbook is it's free um, so this is this has been one of the most amazing things about the ITSI initiative is the um, the generosity that people have had in sharing the um, the information that they've developed as well. I've got another question here. In some hospitals, we prepared dysphagia meals both for adults and children. We wouldn't be able to produce both types of minced and moist meals. What would you suggest we do? Um, that's um, it. Look. That's certainly a challenge there. Um, I think that would be something that at, at each centre that you would need to talk to um, your clinical governance people as to what, what level of risk they are comfortable with. Um, seek advice from your medical staff as well. Um, again, that whole cross-sector collaboration um, as to the best way of managing that. Um, I have another question here. I wanted to get some clarification on the particle size with the four millimetre by 1.5, would noodles be accepted? Um, so yes, so long as they are absolutely no larger than 1.5 millimetres in length, um, most noodles would be, and again, so long as they're not um, greater than four by four millimetres in the other two dimensions. So again, it just gives a little bit more, even visually, a little bit more textural variety for, so that it, it looks like food. People recognise it at food, as food. Um, and so that's a, a, a real clinical advantage there. It also gives the sensory information of the desire to chew, which uh, we use therapeutically. Um, you mentioned particle size, softness and moisture content. Is there a specific moisture recommended? So um, the, the best way we can describe that is using the, um, the spoon tilt test. So moist enough means that it, so it's not wet, it's not dripping through, um, but it means it's going to hold its shape um, together and, and not come off. Um, in terms of measuring uh, moisture content, we know for cereal-based foods, by the time you come to chew them um, and swallow them down, there's around about 50% um, moisture content. Now, you've got some foods that are, that are naturally moist, things like your, um, your fruits, obviously, um, and some vegetables. Um, there are some other vegetables, like a potato, for example, where it's quite starchy, where you'll need to add... Um, you know, whether it's butter or, or um, cream or, or those sorts of things to it to provide the extra moisture that's going to be needed there. So has anybody thought um, if you're making food yourselves in your kitchens, how you might start to um, implement some of these things that Julie's been talking about? There's a question there, Julie, it's popped up as well, temperature-wise. Yep. What is the most suitable for testing? Room temperature, hot or cold? Terrific. And then we'll... So with, with that particular one, each time, if you can think of your testing as you want it to be safe when the person is eating it, so you want it to be at the temperature that they're going to be eating it at. Now, So if it's a room temperature food, then testing it at room temperature is fine. If it's a hot food, 
then testing it um, at roughly the temperature that's required there. Around that, just something else to bear in mind in terms of testing temperature, and this is where there is a little bit of a disparity between um, some of the food safety things. So you might need to cook it to 70 degrees to make sure you've killed all the bugs and everything. Um, but that temperature, if you try and eat it at that temperature, will actually give you oral burns. Um, so, and particularly for people with swallowing problems, the time the food spends in their mouth, um, the longer that it's sitting in their mouth, the longer the chance that they um, they could end up with um, with oral burns there. So, just being um, aware of that, it does need to be a bit cooler to actually eat it. And different foods retain their temperature differently. So, things like tomato and cheese, for example, will hold on to that heat a bit longer. Um, there's a question here: What are people using as a thickener? Um, so, there are many. Um, the thickeners that are used for to thicken drinks, um, I'm aware, are also being used um, to help provide a bit of um, stability or, or get foods to hold their shape as well. So some of them are being used for moulded pureed foods as well. You will need to adjust the amount of thickener that you add depending on the moisture that's there because the, the way the thickener works is it naturally pulls moisture in. Um, so you'll need to, um, to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, another question here, am I aware of any Australian hospitals who've already implemented the proposed ITSI changes? So no, um, no one has actually implemented at this point in time because we're trying, um, trying to steer a, um, a a big ship, if you like, towards implementation on the first of May two thousand and nineteen, um, and and trying to bring everyone along for that ride there. Um, that said, I am aware of a number of places that are doing their auditing and that's something that you can do right away. Um, so there are um, the audit sheets that I showed you up there. You can, um, you can use, I'm in the process with my um, project officer hat on of developing an Excel spreadsheet so that you could write, you know, write in what it is and, and you know, tick things off as to whether it's, um, it's met the requirements. But another question here, soft textures. Um, have roast meats. Um, so this this particular one we're talking about, our uh, minced and moist, and we will spend um, the, the webinar next time talking about soft textures, so our soft and bite sized. With your roast meats, um, I would need to consult a, a chef as to whether you roast those up as far as a minced consistency is concerned and, the, and then um, try and break them down using a food processor perhaps with some um, with some gravy, Troy, I don't know whether you can add um, anything to that. That's what I would probably recommend. You'd probably want to cook your roast first mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, texture modify it down with the yep. food processor. Or I suppose you could chop it as well for the adults. If it's four centimetres by four centimetres, um, it would oh. probably be okay to chop it, getting it, but, but, sorry, four millimetres. Um, the, the, the infant one or the baby one is probably going to be a little bit more difficult. You want to probably pulse that in a food processor. Yep, exactly. So I guess, you know, in terms of talking about things like whether it's a RoboCoop or a, or a food processor, what we're talking about with this mince consistency is a kind of like a rough mashing, if that makes sense. Um, so they're not going, yeah, hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Um, would the audit sheets only be used in recipe development or every time a recipe is made? So um, definitely in recipe development and no, not every time a recipe is made. My goodness, we're not, we're not trying to make your life too difficult. Whatever your quality assurance purposes currently are, if you would audit your meals, you know, I don't know. And again, maybe Troy, you can let us know how often people might audit from a quality assurance um point of view, whether it's weekly, monthly, just to make sure that everything's staying within check. I'm going to pass over to you. <laughs> um, look, I do. Uh, that'd probably be a dietetic question. Um, and Denise isn't in here at the moment. Um, it all depends. I know that dietitians in um, hospitals, particularly in the Queensland Health Hospitals, will be doing quality checks up in the wards or at the end of the plating line every day, particularly at the end of the plating line. Um, mm -hmm. So they'd be happening periodically from a food safety perspective, completely different. But yeah, from a quality perspective, it would be periodically. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I know those audit sheets look a bit daunting to start with, but um, it's actually really very straightforward once you get going and, and perhaps maybe even the Excel sheet will be helpful there. Um, even though we've got on the audit sheets there that uh, the concept of testing at time of service 15 and 30 minutes later, it's really where it absolutely must be safe is when the person's eating it, so at time of service. Though the other two time points are included there um, so that you've got an idea of how the product behaves, you know, if it's left for 15 minutes, so the patient has to um, go to the bathroom or gets called away for an x-ray or something like that without reheating, is it still going to be safe or is it not going to be safe basically? Um, Another question here, in terms of getting the particle size right, do we puree, roast, wet dish and add in a cooked mince meat to achieve the size needed? Good for large volumes. Troy, can you answer that one? Is, Paula, you're making a statement there or I think that might just be... Oh, right. My apologies. Surely, I think that's what they're saying there. Paul's saying they do at St Vincent's in Sydney. Yeah, um, Troy. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a statement. So perhaps you might be able, if you have a recipe or if you have a technique of how you do it, you might be able to, um, if you're happy to, and if people think it's a, you might be able to help them out, if you are happy to share it, if you can, if you're happy to, um, give it to myself and um, I can get it to Julie and we can get it out to people. But it sounds obviously... Um, you Troy, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we can get that out. We can supply a recipe to Troy and that's basically how we do all of our mince and moist at the moment. We do so how do you do it? Explain it. Yeah, so we basically take the, the general items and do a pureed version. And then if it's a chicken dish, we have cooked chicken mince to a, a particle size specification and we add that through the pureed meal. Great. Yeah. That's okay, true. That's, well, that's obviously going to meet a very high nutritional value as well. So you're not going to be having, you know, roast chicken with a heap of gravy and it's not going to yeah. actually be, it's going to be more gravy than meat. So you, you're obviously ticking a lot of boxes with that one. Yeah, cool. Just thought I'd let you know. Yeah, that's no, that's wonderful. really cool. Yeah, because you can, you know, obviously these days get, you know, turkey mince, um, beef mince, yeah. pork, lamb. lamb mince, chicken mince. Yeah, that's really good. That's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, now, we've also got a question. Is the implementation date May 2019 or is there a phased approach? Um, so the, the steering committee has um, suggested that May 2019 is the implementation date. However, um, I think they'd also be very open to the fact that um, you've got to do what works well for your facility. So if it, if it helps your facility to do it as a phased approach, that's fine. I'm, I'm aware that there are some um, facilities who've decided that they're going to do the liquids first and when they're comfortable with those, then they're going to gradually move across to the, the foods. There are other places that are, are doing it in the reverse. Um, so, you know, both of those are, are quite suitable. Um, I think there's one here where the question didn't quite get finished. To thicken the texture yeah. of the food shape. Um, so uh, there's a participant M column. Um, I think the question didn't quite get finished on um, the chat. But I know John Patterson is asking a question there yep. as well, Julie. Sure, so there are a number of aged care sites already using mince puree moulding, assuming they're using current standards, so wondering how far this communication has been rolled out. Um, that's a great question. Um, thanks, John. We are um, doing our best to reach as many stakeholders as possible. Um, I know that we have um, a number of clinicians, but not necessarily aged care sites um, who have um, linked on to the, um, the IDSI newsletter. Um, I'm also doing some work with the, the Lantern Project um, around, particularly since the announcement of the Royal Commission, um, looking at uh, texture modified food. So we're, we're trying to get that information out. In terms of the moulding, probably the um, it, it's where that works really well, visually very appealing, um, just making sure that it's not too sticky. That's probably the one thing um, that some of those moulded foods um, just need to be a little bit aware of. So whether you need to add a bit more moisture to it um, so that it, it doesn't pose a choking risk there. So Julie, in mm. theory, 
how different is this? How different are the ITSI standards than what we currently have? They're, they're really not particularly different at all. So I think it, the Australian standards, we had five millimeter, we, we have pulled that back to four millimeters. It's not a, not a drastic change, but that said, we've also allowed a little bit more of the irregularity, if you like, of the particle size that previously wasn't there. Um, for the paediatrics, mm -hmm. it was two millimetres. It's still two millimetres. Um, and we've just asked people to think about the, the right size to, to, um, of the person um, as their benchmark for when you change across from a, um, you know, the very small, the two millimetre size to the four millimetre um, particle size. So I'm not certain what John um, might have been meaning with that one, but I know for, Queen, for his question, hopefully we've answered that, but for mm -hmm. Queensland Health Facilities, um, mm -hmm. a lot of those facilities buy the, the um, food ready-made in. So that question might be referring to those manufacturers. So that in Queensland, there's Neutral Fresh and, you know, in Victoria, there's Textured Concept Foods and yes. I know they send a lot of stuff around the country. There's stuff... Of that comes here to Queensland to um, obviously Victoria, not 100% certain what Health Share do in New South Wales, but I know the TCF stuff also goes to um, Western Australia, etc. So John's actually clarifying here there's a company I believe will be introducing texture modified products in 500 gram packs that can be then molded on site. So um, we, I'm we assuming certainly... that. I'm assuming that if they're, if they're manufacturing companies and they're starting to make products to fit the Australian market, um, they're doing enough, and this might sound harsh, but they're doing enough research to determine that this is what we're doing in Australia and they're going to try and meet our, our needs. And um, I, I know that with um, your members of the ITSI steering committee mm -hmm. um, there's big companies on there but you also have a communication um, network do you Julie for like those smaller companies we do so our stakeholder list um, does include companies like the ones um, that you've mentioned we've got a range of um, different companies that produce texture modified foods um, thick drinks um, and even um, medication swallowing aids as well for example um, so they receive the information um, a number of them have been in touch with me directly um, asking questions and, and clarifying to make sure that they've got things right um, but also can I ask clinicians when you're aware of the ITSI standards and, and doing the, the testing methods that if you happen to see some pre-prepared stuff that comes through, um, still do your, your testing and your checking um, and give them feedback um, on that as well. And that way we're all working together towards a common goal. So I suppose one of the things would be if we're using um, like a product, if we're texture modifying food and we're using a product to then shape the food, mm -hmm. how is that going to affect, will that affect what we're actually trying to achieve with the ITSI? Like, because you're saying that the food needs to be quite moist but not too sticky or mm -hmm. like the, the liquid or whatever that's going in with the food. So if we've shaped it, is that going to change what we're doing or is it still going to um, fit the needs? So it, it really depends. Um, depends on the, the type of agent that's being used um, as to how firmly it will bind the particles together. So if it, if it glues them back together so that they don't really move, that you need to chew them again, then it's um, a, a need to use a lot of chewing. So there, it's probably less a concern for the minced and moist diet because we are clinically, we're saying that people need to have a small amount of chewing ability and should be able to break it apart with their tongue. Um, and that's certainly your fail safe. If you're not sure, clinicians, I would ask you, food service, anybody, put it in your mouth and see what you need to do to break it down. If you need to chew it a lot, it's not suitable. If you only need to give it one or two chews um, or you can use your tongue to break it apart, then it probably is suitable. Um, if it's sticking to the roof of your mouth, it is not suitable. Um, and, and that's where I was saying, I guess it really depends on the, the type of um, thickening agent as well and how much... Uh, moisture is around because if it's sucked all the moisture in and become a very sticky thing then it, it has the runs the risk of being a choking risk then 
Um, so we use products for moulded food where the taste and protein remain high. Products um, are shape it and mould it both very good. So thank you for, for that information there. Um, yeah, so as I say, there, there is some um, variability uh, just depending on what the item is, you know, because we get seasonal variability, you know, with carrots, for example, they might have a high water content one season. And then if the growing conditions are slightly different, they might not be quite as moist the following season. So um, that's why the, the quality control and checking to make sure that it meets all of those things. So the particle size requirements, the softness requirements and the moisture requirements um, are really important. Um, and then are the previous webinar links available on the IHHC website? That one's for you, Troy. Um, no, they're not at the moment, Paul, that, but they are available on the IDSI webpage under resources. Um, and then another question there, thank you. Are peas suitable for the Minster Moist Level 5 and are there other vegetables to avoid? Um, so peas will need to be, um, because of their round shape, um, they that the shape itself is is um, a bit of an issue, so they need to come down um, in size. Um, so they will need a, like a pulsing, I think, is as you suggested there. And also just checking to see if the skin's coming off. You want a, a method of being able to sieve those off. Um, also, um, beans would be something um, again if they've got string in them that you would want to probably avoid that. Um, things with fibres in them, I'm thinking of things like rhubarb, for example. Um, so, so looking at any of those things that are not going to um, come down easily to the um, the particle size or have corn's an interesting one, Julie. Mm -hmm. Corn. Corn. How, what would you recommend with corn? Do you have to get rid of the um, like the little husk that the corn kernel is in or or can that just be mashed or i suppose we're not talking about vitamized here no um, this is but in theory i suppose minced and moist yeah um, um and I, I look i think you're right if that if that husk is hard and firm then you don't want it in there if it's um you know if it's like a creamed corn then that would be fine i would imagine okay Corn is a very interesting one. Uh, what about asparagus? I suppose if the stems are nice and um, like soft and not woody, mm -hmm. um, they'd be okay. Carrots, I suppose, would be okay. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're doing the whole mash with the fork, aren't you? So yeah so you as I say, using those three different parameters, using the fork to make sure the particle size is correct, then using the fork just to, to make sure that you can break it apart very easily with um with, you know with very lim limited pressure um there as well and that it's nice and moist and going to hold together and not be sticky lots of questions today so very good that's great um, obviously a lot of interaction and we've we've sparked a lot of interest with people other than that um julie's email address is there you have mine as well so email either of us and i if it comes to me i'll shoot it to julie julie's at the national conference in two weeks time talking um and doing a presentation on idsi um and i will get the links on the ihhc web page to go from there so everybody's thanking us we appreciate your time we know everybody's busy it's an hour so we'll end this um just remember next month we um going to be um having the webinar on the monday and i think Paul, uh, John's saying something there about companies are using ITSI as their standards. We are asking manufacturers to get in touch with them. So, um, yeah, look, if you and if you're if you're a jurisdiction and you're dealing with suppliers, let them know what you're mm. doing. Queensland Health are talking to our suppliers, um, the Spotless people, St Vincent's people, um, other companies out there. If you're talking to your suppliers, let them know what's happening. And then the best resource for them is um, the ITSI webpage. Do you have anything else you want to say, Julie? No, I think you've covered everything, Troy. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everybody. I'll talk soon. Will do. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. See ya.